This happened in 1993. Back then, I co-owned a gas station in a small town you've probably never heard of before. We didn't have many employees at the time, and so I often found myself working the register through the night. We weren't one of those 24-hour gas stations, but we did stay open till 3 a.m. I remember one night working the register, looking at the clock and seeing it hit 2.30. I hadn't seen a customer in probably 30 minutes to an hour. I started organizing the shelves, getting the place ready to close up. As I stood in the corner of the building, to my surprise, I heard the door chime telling me a customer had entered. I walked around a shelf to greet them. It was a man. He had a tall and skinny build, wearing sweatpants and a light-colored t-shirt. His clothes were covered in blood stains. I was frozen and felt a sudden surge of concern, wondering who hurt the guy. Breathing heavily, he told me that he had just been in a car crash. I went to the back room, assuring him that we had a first aid kit. I offered to call for an ambulance, but he adamantly refused any medical attention or the police, instead asking me to show him to the bathroom. I pointed to the corner of the store where it was located. As he walked there, a few more times he told me not to call the police. I understood not wanting to get the police involved, but it started to concern me how many times he felt he needed to tell me. I started thinking about it more. And that's when I had the realization. Despite the bloodstains, I hadn't seen any actual visible wounds. Additionally, the man was walking almost perfectly normal for just having been in a car crash. My heart started racing. I ran outside and to the side of the building where our payphone was. I dialed 911. A female dispatcher answered. I relayed what had just occurred in a quiet tone, explaining how the man was still inside the building in the bathroom. The lady was silent for a few seconds, before I was informed of a recent stabbing homicide that had occurred in the next town over reported only 30 minutes ago. I asked for a description of the suspect, and to my horror, the woman proceeded to describe the man I had just seen. Tall, skinny, in grey sweatpants and a light colored t-shirt. I asked for officers immediately, and was told to wait in my car with the doors locked. In less than 10 minutes, there were 5 cop cars in front of my store. Guns drawn, the police entered the building. I stayed outside with another officer giving my statement, but I was interrupted by the abrupt commotion from inside. The man in the bathroom had reportedly jumped at one of the officers with a knife as they opened the bathroom door. However, he was soon overpowered by five or six more officers. He was handcuffed and stuffed inside one of the patrol vehicles. Needing to know, I couldn't help but ask one of the officers that had gone inside what the man was doing in there. He revealed that the man had injected himself with drugs, planning to emerge from the bathroom with a knife, attacking me and taking off with the store's money. A decade later, I got curious and did some digging on the guy. He was charged with the murder of a Dairy Queen employee in the next town over, and is serving life in prison. I was on a week-long hunting trip at my uncle's cabin in Alaska. My uncle owned a large chunk of land out there and would time and again offer me his cabin for a few days, free of charge. I've always had a love for hunting and take almost every chance I get to go up there. There's just something nice about the cabin in the woods with no internet type of setting that I've grown to love. I was lucky enough to find a sturdy tree stand after walking around in the woods for a while. Arguably the best time to hunt is very early in the morning. I found the stand an hour before sunrise using a strong headlight I had bought a few years back. As I sat up there, it started snowing. I regretted not bringing an extra jacket, but I figured I'd be fine if I kept my mind busy until the sun came out and started heating things up. My wife had recently bought me a night vision scope and so I pulled it out looking for any game. Surprisingly, just as I looked down the scope, I heard movement in the distance. But it wasn't a deer, or any animal I was expecting. It was a person. My first thought was it was another hunter, but he wasn't wearing anything orange, which was required of all hunters during rifle season. And plus, he didn't have any hunting gear. He was dragging a large duffel bag and had a shovel. He was wearing a t-shirt, but other than that I couldn't make out any details. It was still dark outside, the night vision could only do so much. Despite the cold, my hands started sweating holding the scope up to my eye. I was terrified knowing I wasn't alone out here. I continued to watch him. 
He grabbed the shovel, looked around, and started digging in the dirt. I was pretty sure I was witnessing a guy burying a dead body on my uncle's property. I had to have stayed frozen like that for at least 15 minutes watching the guy. I had no way of contacting anybody, and if I moved to try and get down, he would surely hear me. The hole he was digging kept getting bigger, and I knew I had to do something. I couldn't stomach what I was watching. At the same time, I feared making even the slightest movement. Yes, I had a gun if it came to it, but I was not going to shoot a person. I put my rifle down to put my headlight back on, getting ready to run. When I looked back down the scope, the man had put the shovel down and started unzipping the duffel bag. I panicked and jumped off the tree stand, landing in the dirt below, running back to the cabin. I'd love to say that I heard footsteps behind me, or I looked behind me and saw that I was being chased, or something cliche, but no. I ran the four to five minutes back to the cabin with nothing. I started my car and drove into town to call my uncle, who showed up with me later that evening back at the cabin. We each grabbed a rifle and started back towards where I thought I had been. We couldn't find it at first, but eventually we found a trail of footsteps in the freshly laid snow. Following them backwards led us straight to the tree stand I had been in. Nearby was the hole left in the ground. Though it was just that, both the duffel bag and the shovel were gone. We followed the footsteps forward for a while until they led off my uncle's property line where we stopped ourselves. The tracks ran into the vast expanse of the forest. I can't say for sure what I witnessed that morning, but there's a good chance it was someone attempting to bury a body. I can't think of a better reason that they would be in the middle of the forest in the pitch black darkness with a shovel and a large duffel bag. I haven't been to my uncle's cabin since. I used to work as a moving truck driver. I would transport people's belongings to their new homes while they flew by plane. It was a decent gig, but it meant driving alone on desolate highways across the country, sometimes in the dead of night. There was one night, I was driving down an isolated stretch of highway in the desert, when I noticed a figure walking on the side of the road. Just seeing another car was a rare occurrence, but to see a person was something else, especially at this hour. As I got closer, he gave me the old arm and thumb. He was a hitchhiker. Immediately, a wave of empathy washed over me as I remembered my early 20s when I was strapped for cash and didn't have a car and often struggled to get around. I had my fair share of time struggling to make ends meet, and so I felt compelled to help the guy out. I was likely the first vehicle he had seen in over an hour. I pulled the truck over and rolled down the window. He approached cautiously, his eyes reflecting a mix of weariness and hope. There was nothing that tipped me off about this situation. He was a regular looking guy in understandably slightly dirty clothes lugging around a suitcase. I offered him a ride, explaining that I was a moving truck driver and had some extra space. He gratefully accepted, hoisting his bag in the back seat and hopping in up front. We exchanged a few words, and I could sense his gratitude for the help. It felt good to offer a helping hand to someone in need, especially someone who reminded me of my own past struggles. I remember asking him where he was heading, and that was what first hit me off to something not being right. He waited a bit before saying, Anywhere but back there. I had gone through a small town 20 minutes prior and assumed that's what he was referencing, but played dumb and said, What's back there? Unexpectedly, he replied, Some really bad choices and not a lot of regret. Taken aback by the answer, I let out a nervous laugh to relieve some of the newfound tension. I felt obligated to push further considering how open-ended of an answer it was. I remember saying something about how interesting of a response that was and what exactly he meant by it. Without warning, his demeanor changed entirely. His eyes shot in my direction, and any smile that was on his face instantly turned into a cold, hard stare. He lifted up his shirt, revealing a large hunting knife tucked in his pants. He told me how inside his suitcase in the bag wasn't clothes, but rather the body of, and listed some full name which I regrettably don't remember. I tried to maintain composure, keeping my eyes on the road while my mind started racing. Dread washed over me as I realized I had made a huge mistake letting this guy in my truck. I didn't know if he was telling the truth or not, but I wasn't about to ask him. 
I knew I had to get out of there, and an opportunity presented itself when I saw a gas station up ahead. I made up some excuse about my truck acting up and told him I would have to pull into the parking lot. As soon as the truck came to a stop, I got out of the driver's seat and ran into the store, leaving the man behind, frantically telling the cashier to call the police. I quickly explained what had happened, and he locked the entrance to the store and used his phone to dial 911. We then waited in the back for an officer to arrive. After what felt like an eternity, we heard knocking on the store's door. Two officers were out front. I gave them my statement and told them to search my truck. The hitchhiker and his suitcase were gone. He had run off somewhere into the desert. It could have been anywhere. Police organized a search unit, but they never found the guy. To this day, I still don't know what was actually in his suitcase, and if he had really killed someone. Police mentioned it was likely that the man was just mentally ill and was saying nonsense. But at least from my first impression, everything told me that he was all there. I've accepted that I won't ever know for sure.